He is Guy Ritchie. His film is Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Here is a trailer. It's a fair time, Bosnia. Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Right, wrap them guns up, count the money, put your seatbelt on. Only a few short years ago, Ritchie was a struggling music video director in London. Now, with the great success his debut film has already earned in Britain, he is suddenly in great demand. Sony has agreed to finance his next project without even reading a script. Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels opens in New York and in Los Angeles on March 5th. I am pleased to have him here on this program. Welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> I am. I saw this story about you, and I said, this is an interesting guy, and we want to talk about it. To look at the trailer, yeah. it, it has the feeling of music video, the influence it might have had on you. Yes? I think that's true. Um, the advantage of coming through um, the music video world is that you pick up all kinds of things that maybe conventionally you wouldn't pick up if you were just in, in feature films and your background just came from feature films because you push the boundaries more. You yeah. find out more about the camera, you find out more about the format, um, you find out more about generally everything to do uh, with, with film. You think that's also true about making commercials? Yes, even more so. Well, not necessarily more so, but you've got more Same money. Same idea. In well, yeah, yeah. But you've got more money in commercials. I mean, you know, all the videos I made, I made between um, five and twenty thousand dollars, which is, you know, absolutely pittance. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. But with uh, with uh, commercials, you've got between one and two million dollars to make a thirty second slot. Mm. What did this cost you to make? This cost about the same price as a commercial. <laughs> um, it uh, we made it for about one point six million dollars cash. One point six million dollars cash. Yeah, cash means what? You went out and raised the money before you could make the film, or what's, cash, the, what's the significance cash. of cash? Cash because there's um, w we just wanted to get the film in the can, and then afterwards it, it costs significantly more. But okay. uh, to actually make it materialise cost one point six, yeah. uh, one point six, one point five. That meant that we could entice people enough to get them to turn up in the day, um, and to actually get it in the can. Thereafter, it costs you know. Well, first you had to entice people like Sting to be in it, didn't you? Yeah. Yes. And that helps when you get someone like Sting. No, it didn't help at all, incidentally. Um, <laughs> like I said, it did not happen, right. help to happen to have Sting in the film. No. <laughs> Why not? I wish it did. I mean, I thought it would have done, yeah. but it didn't. You it were was, counting on it. Well, I was to some degree, because <laughs> yeah. uh, the whole thing about raising finances is it depends on who your cast is. Yeah. And uh, we had no one in there. And then we stumbled across Sting, and Sting was doing the ironing or something in the back. And his wife, um, who's a prospective financier, uh, thought she put some, some money into it. And Sting saw the film uh, in the background and said, he saw a short film that I made yeah. and said, uh, cool, I'd like to be a part of this. And uh, I loved whatever he'd done. So I said, you know, jump on board. And uh, he jumped on board. We paid, him, we paid him quite a lot. I think we paid him about 25 quid uh, <laughs> for a week's work. <laughs> Tell me the storyline. I mean, obviously it begins with a big stakes gamble uh, in which they're going to take 100 thousand pounds and yeah. go in there which is the wife's what what's the where does the money come from uh the wife's what where, where does the money come from uh the money comes from uh there's a consortium of, of five guys four yeah. guys and they put up twenty five thousand pounds each right. um and they throw it into the the kitty because they trust their friend eddie yeah. who's uh who's got a, an impressive track record of gambling up to this point um he then probably loses it not only does he lose it he loses half a million quid um on top of that, because he keeps raising the stakes, raising the stakes, and eventually, and he borrows off Hatchet Harry, who's the guy that's, um, uh, they have to, he's the guy, he's his advocate, if you like, and uh, so he's given one week to raise the money, um, all half a million quid, otherwise he'll, he'll chop a finger off for each day that goes by. But really it's to do with all the, the side plots, the, uh, the, the narratives around that. I mean, there's, there's like ten different stories going on, and that, that's what uh, that's the common link that joins them all together. But the idea is is that you know you're supposed to it's not supposed to be patronising for this kind yeah. of a genre. You know you're supposed to think about it's supposed to keep your, your brain uh, fidgeting. Yeah. Was there, there was no film that was a model for what you wanted to do in this film. Um, what do you mean? Well, was there one? There was no particular film, whether it was Reservoir Reservoir Dogs or some other film that you said I want to make a film that has that kind of energy, that kind of. No, of, of as the answer. In your face, that kind of no, something. No, I mean, I, I like things like, uh, I'm inter in, interested in the humour. Um, so I wanted, I love Get Shorty. I thought Get Shorty yeah. was a very funny film. Um, so, and I love that kind of humour, which I didn't think was trying too hard, but at the same time it managed to maintain um, some credibility. It was an interesting film to watch, not purely as a sort of humorous knees up. 
Um, so I wanted something that had credibility behind it, and I wanted to make the bad guys really bad guys, and uh, the funny stuff reasonably funny. And we've ended up with something that I'm quite happy with. And it also, you wanted to tell a story about some kind of milieu, some the underworld of London? Yeah, I mean, you can, in theory, you can take this story and stick it anywhere else, but it needed an identity. So, you know, I used a sort of Cockney identity to, to hook everything on. Yeah. Did you think it was too long, I read somewhere? Yeah, I took out ten minutes the, uh, the day before we did the final lock-off. I had one last screening. You see, the producer, the producer and I argue about this. I think it's too long and he thinks this it's too Matthew short. This is Matthew Vaughan? This is Matthew Vaughan, yeah. yeah. He thinks it's too short and you think it's too long. Yes, and which you... is not often the case when it comes to producing director teams. <laughs> it's in fact it's, the reverse. Yeah, it's in fact the reverse. But I thought it was uh, necessary in this case to, to really gun, to really move at a pace. And, uh, and we've That's done the music that. video background. No, not necessarily. I just think it's uh, it just it serves this film to be like that. To full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. Yeah. And it's uh, I think it goes on for about one forty, one forty five or something. And before it was running closer to two hours. And then once I lost that ten minutes, yeah. it flew. Do you have a commercial eye when you're making this? Are you asking yourself, does this play? Is an audience going to like this? Is this? Yes, in short. Yeah. I think every director does. I mean. I mean, they can say that they don't, but I'm not sure if that's a truth because um, every director will always want more screens. And uh, by definition, that must mean he wants more people to see it. Yeah. So, um, yes. I and mean, by definition, the more people come to see it, the better options you have next time sure. out to make a movie. Sure. Right. When people start talking about train spotting yeah. and make a comparison, you say what? No, not particularly. I mean, the thing is, it's, it's about four guys, and it happens to be shot in the UK. Right. So, you know, the comparisons are going to be <laughs> it there. It stops there, huh? Yeah. I mean, I think it does. I mean, I was never interested in a film about heroin abusers, or yeah. whatever you call them. I mean, that's just not my, my cup of tea. I think they did an extremely good job of what they did, but, you know, to me, that's pff, yeah, it's not really my thing. How about uh, Tarantino? Is there... I think he's very good. I think he's very good at what he does, and, uh, you know... But anybody who's tried to compare with you with... I'm not sure if they try and compare me. I think what they try and compare, what they, what they want to do is pigeonhole the film. Yeah. They'll say, oh, this film is in the vein of Pulp Fiction yeah. and Get Shorty. And that, to me, is fine. Um, I don't have a problem with that, because I like someone to compare films to me. You know, I go, what kind of film is it? It's you a Richie film. It's, uh, OK, well, later, <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah. Tell me how you got here to make this movie. I mean, when did you decide that what I want to do is right. what I'm doing? Um, well, I left school when I was 15, and I was, uh, I was only inter Booked. interested in the arts when I was um, at school. And then when I left school, I got misled into sort of various paths. Yeah. And then um, it was when I was about 25 that I, I dawned. I was actually 24, turning 25. And it suddenly dawned on me that I wanted to go back into films, uh, which is what I really wanted to do. This was when you were doing music video or something No, no, I t no I, I've done the whole lot in the last five years. I'm 30 now, yeah. and I started when I was 25. So it's been over the last five years. Um, so from my 25th birthday, I started running, which is effectively tea making. And then after I did that for a year or so, I then made music videos. It's just the linear way to go into making features. It just mm -hmm. seems like the most co co common sense, really. It's logical. You make music vids, which are much easier to make than feature films. Yeah. Um, less, uh, less stressful to make a, a feature film, incidentally. Um, then commercials, and then commercials, short film, bosh, yeah. into a feature film. Who are your heroes? Hmm. Tricky one. Tricky one. I'll have to get back to you on that. All right, well, come before I finish. I want to know, so be <laughs> thinking about it. All right, I'll throw to the clip. Take a look at this. This is, some people are not crazy about the title. You say? Yeah, I say, well, that's a marketing ploy. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted a title that was so long that people couldn't forget it. You must remember when we, when we started this film, we had, you know, absolutely yeah. uh, no marketing hooks whatsoever. So I wanted a title that, you know, was so long it would just stick off the outside of cinema. It was so long that... Lock, people... stock, and two smoking barrels. It's relevant as well. It is relevant. That's what they have to go out and get the $500,000 or also begin the 500,000 about... pounds. They also start losing their fingers. Yeah, it's about antique shotguns. This is one of the side plots. And it's the antique shotguns that is actually the whole story is about. Uh, these shotguns called Purdy's, which are, you know, cost... I think they cost about a quarter of a million quid each. Um, they're extremely expensive sporting guns. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people think they're just normal guns, you know, and so they buy them in order to do a bank robbery, if you like, and then it transpires that these guns are worth more than any other job that they're doing. <laughs> exactly. So that's then all the, the money in the bank. Yeah. And, Voila. And, and what do they do, and what's so special about these guns, other than the craftsmanship that made them? 
Uh, nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a scene in which set it up for me. It's called You Want It, You Buy It. Tom, played by Jason Fleming. Fleming? Fleming. Fleming. Yeah. Tries to sell Nick the Greek, Stephen Marcus, a stolen stereo. Yeah. Need I know more? Um, no, I don't think you do. Okay, keep remembering heroes. Roll tape, here it is. That is 900 Nicker in any shop you're lucky enough to find one in, and you're complaining about 200. What school of finance did you study? It's a deal. It's a steal. It's sale of the f***ing century. I saw Steve Tisch on the street today. I think with Matthew Vaughn. I don't know. Yes. Quite a bit. It would have been. Okay, and he was talking about you. Uh, Tisch is investing in this film. Yes. He also invested in Forrest Gump. Yes, sir. <laughs> Not one of mine. <laughs> the point is he's got good judgment. Uh, it appears so. Yeah. Are you... What are your hopes for this? What do you want to do? I mean, you said some quote that you read, that I read somewhere, like you're going to rip the ass out of the American box office. Christ, I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> did you say that or not say that? Or does it... I may have thought it, yeah. but... <laughs> but what did it no, mean? No, I mean, what I'd like Whatever is... you said, what do you want to do with the American box office? Um, well, I, obviously, it, I, it'd be great to be successful here. Um, I've done very well at home, and that was really what yeah. my goal was, to be successful here would be, you know, icing on the cake. Well, it'd probably be more the cake more than the, the icing. Yes, actually. I was going to say. Um, <laughs> considering this is the biggest market in the world, yeah. then, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very important. Yeah. Um, but, you know, who knows? I mean, so far the Americans have, have really gone for it, much more so than the English. So um, it remains to see, uh, yeah. to be seen. What, but what it could, in a sense, blast you into another zone in terms of opportunity to make movies. Sure. Not bad. That's not bad at all. I'm certainly not moaning about that. Where are the women in this movie? Uh, well, there aren't any. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of women in there. One picks up a machine gun and shoots lots of things. Yeah. Um, Just didn't fit the story. No, I mean, the identity of the film was to go uh, the lad's way, if you like. Um, that's not necessarily to say it's a macho film. Uh, I tried very hard to make it not so. Yeah. Um, but it just... It felt as though we were being too formulaic to have a romantic interest in there, or, or it just didn't work having yeah. any it, women. It had in. no. There was no. There's a couple of matron figures no in there. No imperative that you do it, and so you didn't do it. Yeah. Right. You got a contract out of this from Sony to make another film. Yes. Do you know what you're going to do? Sure. Yeah. No, I've written several other scripts, and uh, one of the, this one's about. Uh, it's tentatively called Diamonds. Um, it has the template of uh, the diamond business, the Jewish diamond business in London, which is you know, a very interesting, interesting world. And outside of that, it has sort of dog fights in it and bare knuckle fights and mm. gypsies in it and various other salubrious underworld activities. The idea, and I haven't seen all of your film, this right. one, uh, the idea seems to be that you like seven or eight simultaneous stories going on. I mean, you like that. Is that a... Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a hurdle and, you know, I think filmmakers need them. A hurdle. Yeah. And the spine of or this... Or challenge, maybe yeah. I should say a challenge. Well, the spine of this story, though, is you always got to have one narrative that's the spine, yes? Or sure. No? And, the, and the spine of this story is? Um, is settling a debt. Yeah, okay. Good luck to you. Thank you very much it's indeed. It's great to meet you. Thank you. Guy Ritchie, who was not in competition at Sundance... That's Hence why you didn't talk about me. Which is the reason we didn't talk about him, because <laughs> uh, they only talked about things were in competition. Why weren't you in competition? Because you're... Because we're British. Because you're British. And you have to be American. There's no category. I <laughs> no, I think so. They must have a category for um, non-American films. Come on. No, no they do. I don't. I, the world cinema. Where is Matthew when we need him? Yeah. With Tish. <laughs> He's with Tish. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.